Ronin climbed atop the back of Illidan's mount, and the beast kind of hissed at him. I settled. Yeah, sure. Malfurion's brother had been very curious of Ronin since they'd met, almost as if he was trying to learn from the wizard's every movement. But Ronin didn't exactly mind. He could sense this young night elf's potential. Out of everyone he'd encountered, Illidan was the only one that came anywhere near having the same magical ability. And it was in everyone's best interest if Ronin helped the young buck as much as he could, provided Illidan was willing to learn. Against the Burning Legion, they were going to need any and every advantage they could get. Lord Ravencrest then ordered his expeditionary force forward, and so they set off, riding out of Suramar in the direction of Zinashari. Despite the force being a very large one, over a thousand, with more due to join, there was still trepidation in the air, and rightly so. Ronin had done his best to really emphasise just how horrific and destructive their foe would be. Ravencrest had adjusted his tactics accordingly. A contingent of his finest fighters were to surround the Moon Guard at all times, ordered to strike at the fell beast's tentacles first, removing the threat of the sorcerers being turned into raisins. And any other weaknesses that Ronin could think of had also been communicated to the soldiers. Now it was just a case of hoping they could all keep their nerve. The Night Elves eventually neared their destination, noticing an eerie green light illuminating from an area up ahead. Something's coming, and fast. It's them. The Legion never wastes time. They live to fight. I would have preferred to scout the area, but if they wish to fight immediately, then by all means. We shall not disappoint them. Sound the call. So, horns blared, and the lines of the Night Elves spread out into battle formation. Now an army of several thousand. The sight of which reminded Ronin of the might of the Alliance, the first time they'd faced the Legion's allies, the Scourge. Unfortunately, things had not gone well for that giant Alliance army on that occasion. But that wasn't going to happen this time, Ronin thought. He then glanced at Illidan, who was looking rather uncharacteristically unsure of himself. Don't lose yourself in fear. You have a gift, Illidan. The well may be cut off, but its essence still permeates the land. The sky. Everything. If you know how to sense it, you can do anything. I follow your wisdom, Shando. Ronin wasn't entirely sure what that meant, but okay. A chorus of horrific battle cries then filled the air. Archers, stand ready. More than a thousand curved bows then aimed skyward, as Lord Ravencrest raised his hand. And as the monsters emerged on the horizon, his hand dropped. Now, we all know that I'm crap at action scenes. I don't have any qualifications in animation whatsoever. So we're going to go full-blown audiobook for a second. After the archers' initial volleys, Ronin and Illidan proved to be very good at killing demons. Illidan's spell is somewhat distasteful and weirdly sadistic, but probably nothing to worry about. The Moonguard, however, proved to be very useless. They prove even more useless when an Eridar warlock shows up and starts melting their skins off. So the battle is pretty even Stevens. Something was going to need to happen in order to break this stalemate, because a war of attrition was not going to end well for the good guys. And there you go, I just summed up seven pages in one paragraph. Shaman, has there been any change? Nothing. The body breathes, but the spirit is absent. It had been three nights since Malfurion had journeyed into the Emerald Dream, with Tyrande watching over his body. They'd moved him to this spare room because the Chamber of the Moon had been kind of needed for other purposes, but things were not looking good. He may sleep forever. His body may wither and die from the lack of sustenance. Brox then touched Tyrande's arm gently. Shaman, you've not slept. Let's step out. Get some air. I can't just leave. There's nothing we can do for him right now. He'll be safe. Everyone else saw Brox as a barbaric creature, but more and more, Tyrande realised that just wasn't true at all. He was a big softy, and he was right. She couldn't help Malfurion if she herself grew weak or ill. So, both the Orc and Priestess made their way out of the temple and started their little stroll. However... Sister, forgive me. I'm Captain Jared Shadowsong. You wish something of me, Captain? A bit of your time, if I may be so bold. I have a prisoner who's in need of aid. To be honest, Tyrande wasn't that interested in helping, but duties took priority. Very well. The captain then looked at the orc for a moment. Is, um, is that coming with us? 
Would you rather he stand out in the square by himself? At that, the captain reluctantly shook his head, turned, and quickly led the pair on. Eventually, they arrived at their destination. We found him in the woods, the evening Lord Ravencrest and his force departed. He was quite weary, and seems to be getting worse. Because of his peculiar nature, I want him alive, if and when Lord Ravencrest returns. That's why I came to see you. Tyrande studied the prisoner. He was indeed peculiar. He looks like one of us, but not like a ghost of one of us, yeah. However, the prisoner seemed more interested in Brox. What is an orc doing here? He knows what Brox is, Tyrande thought. That's interesting. The prisoner then started to cough violently, so the priestess got to work, doing some priestess stuff. You're gifted. I had hoped for that. What ails you? Nothing your abilities can cure, I'm afraid. I convinced the captain to find one such as you because time is running scarce. You never told me to do any such thing. I went by my own choice. As you say. The prisoner then returned his attention to Brox. Now, you are something I did not calculate on, and that worries me. You shouldn't be here. <laughs> wizard said that too. What? What wizard? One with flame for her. The prisoner then started to laugh. Either chance, fate, or Nosdormu moves this matter forward. Praise be. Forgive my manners. You may call me Krasus. Krasus? Ronan spoke of you. Elder, I am Broxigar. This is the shaman, Taranda. Brox's reaction and attitude towards Krasus was enough to convince Taranda, so she immediately turned to the captain. I would like to take him back with me to the temple. Out of the question. If he escapes, you have my promise that he will not. Besides, you yourself said it was essential that he be well. After all, if he must face Lord Ravencrest... Ah, uh, fine. Well, I'll have to escort you there myself. Of course. Dorinda then turned back to Krasis, and as she did, the priestess noticed him sort of stifling a satisfied smile. Something pleases you. For the first time since my inopportune arrival, there's hope. The group then returned to the temple, and Tyrande, being completely and utterly an autopilot, led them directly to the door of the room in which Malfurion was. It wasn't what she'd intended to do, but obviously her mind was still somewhat obsessing over him. Is there a problem? No. It's... This room's being used for a stricken friend of mine. Out of nowhere, Grace has pulled himself free of both Tyrande and Brox's grasp, and burst towards Malfurion's prone form. Chance, fate, or Nosdormu indeed. What ails him? Quickly. I... He walked the Emerald Dream. He's not come back, Elder. Not come back? Where did he seek to go? The Orc then explained what had happened, and Krasis' face somehow went even more pale than it already was. Of all the places. But it makes bitter sense. If only I'd known before I'd left there. You were in Zinashari. I was in what remained of the city. But I came here in search of your very friend. And if, as you say, he's been like this for the past few nights, I may be too late. For all of us. 